I'm Aria Schwartz along with Rachel Galligan and welcome to the Windsider Show where it's all about the W. Today we are honored to welcome to the show our guest, undrafted to WNBA champion to Olympic gold medalist, Tali Bivilacqua. like our show please consider joining our patreon community patreon.com backslash windsider for less than a cup of coffee a month you can directly show support for the hard work we do covering the w and don't forget to see our amazing staff's written content over at windsider.com that's windsider.com while you're there check out our overseas tracker it's live now and you can see where your favorite WNBA players are playing overseas all in one place welcome to the show Tali Bevilacqua, your career is an amazing story. You were undrafted and you end up not just making a team, but winning a WNBA ring and an Olympic medal. Tell us about your basketball journey from the start. You know, how, how did this begin? Oh, wow. Um, how far back do we want to go here? That's the question. Um, well, you know, I grew up in a very small country town in Australia, a um, population of about four and a half, five thousand 5,000 people. And... Um, my dad was a farmer, mum was a housewife, um, and they just, you know, basically allowed me to do everything that I wanted, which basically included every, playing every sport that was on offer. And I'll forward it a little bit, but, um, you know, I, I decided to pursue basketball, um, kind of around the age of 15. That was like the sport that really took over at that age and, and dominated and, from there, it just kind of escalated, it went from, you know, just playing as a kid to then playing in the senior ranks in Australia. And from there, I, my agent tested the waters, um, sent the old VCR out to all the teams and, and got a bite in 98 with the Cleveland Rockers. And um, it, it, I mean, it's just been a snowball um, effect. And it hasn't happened. The, the funny thing with my career is like it didn't happen at an early age for me. So, you know, I didn't come to the WNBA until I was 25. So it was a, a bit of a slow process because I wasn't really a big name. It took a little while for me to establish myself back in Australia in the WNBL. Um, but a lot of luck, a lot of luck brought me, brought me over to America. And, you know, you just need that one bit of luck and the rest can, as I say, the rest is history now. It's just yeah, you see it on my resume. <laughs> well, that, that, that's incredible to me because, I mean, we're talking about 98, like you said, you were 25 years old at that time. Mm-hmm. What was it What was it about your game? I mean, you're 5'7", correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and in Well, your- I will actually, I need to do correct you. And please, Wikipedia, um, we all know what? that you're all exactly true on Wikipedia. <laughs> um, it kind of inflated, and I don't know if that was me doing that or not, but I am 5'4". What? <laughs> imports imports seem to uh, lose a few inches on that plane flight over. Wow, interesting. Okay, all right then. Well, you you seem much bigger, at least when I've seen you in person. But I'm also looking <laughs> from the top. Okay, well, we, someone needs to get on Wikipedia and correct that. But okay, so with your size and coming from a different country at that time, the league was old, not not a, basically a year old. What was it about your play, um, the way you played, your tenacity? Like, what was it that got you noticed? Because we all know there's a lot of great players at that time that could have filled those roster spots. So what was it? Like, tell us how you played. Yeah, well, most definitely about the, the talent that is around, So, uh, which, uh, you know, I pinch myself even more so for. Um, so in the Australian League, I, I really established myself as a uh, a blue collar um, blue collar worker. Uh, my defense was my bread and butter. I was that scrappy player, diving on the ball, um, diving on the floor for all the loose balls, um, putting my body on the line, taking the charges, um, just being that disruptive person, um, and being given the the challenge of of kind of in most games uh, defending the best player on the other side, whether they were a guard themselves or sometimes whether they were post players. Um, so that was kind of um, my game. And then in 98, the Cleveland Rockers um, going into training camp were having a lot of injuries. 
So my agent just my, he had sent my my tape at the right time to them, and um, they saw my tape, and it was like three in the morning. I was sleeping in Australia. I get a phone call, and it's the Cleveland Rockers, and they're like, "Hey, um, do you think you can get it? Can can you get on a plane in the next four hours? Um, we'd like you to come over and join training camp." And so in a space of four hours, I packed a bag, was on a flight, calling my parents on the way to the airport to let them know I was flying to America. Um, And it was really daunting at first because, um, you know, I rock into training camp um, and it's midway through camp. So all the players are really bonded with one another. And, you know, they all have their little groups and stuff. So, you know, I walk into the gym and you just feel – every set of eyes on you, um, kind of sussing you out. And, um, so that was kind of really daunting, but it didn't take long for me to settle down and, um, get to know everybody. And, you know, I did enough to keep my spot for the start of the season. Um, and then obviously once players got over injuries and started to come back in, they had to make some tough decisions. Um, I won't go into it too much, but, you know, I was told I'd done enough to retain my spot for the season, but somehow that, um, got flipped around and uh, the next thing I was being told that, you know, I was getting let go. So I was, I was really kind of thrown by that and, you know, put a real bad taste in my mouth about the WNBA at that stage. And so I didn't come back in 99, um, but there were a few teams in 2000, the Miami, Miami soul, uh, Portland fire and the Indiana fever um, all, um, we're starting up in 2000. So I decided to come over and give it another shot and attend the training camps of two of those three teams. It wasn't the Indiana Fever, it was Miami and Portland. Um, and it was my defensive intensity and the tenacity that really caught the eye of the, the coaches. So the Portland Fire coach was Linda Hargrove, and she coached a player by the name of Debbie Black. I'm sure you've heard that name. Oh, yeah. And I know. So yeah. Because I reminded her of Debbie Black, um, that was my in. <laughs> so. That got me three years there with Portland. Wow. Wow. And, and, and it's cool. I, I want to do, I, I do want to take it back. I mean, we're talking about franchises that don't exist anymore with the mm-hmm. Cleveland Rockers, the Portland Fire, Miami. Obviously, you spent the most time with Portland, but kind of what were those franchises like at the time um, for maybe even the modern day WBA fan who's new to the league? Can you give us a glimpse of what those were like? Oh, sure. I mean, in Portland, it was great. We had established um, by the end of the third year, we had established a very solid fan base, which is why it was extremely surprising, shocking um, when we woke up to a message one day to say that the team had folded like it came out of nowhere Um, when you kind of dig into it a little bit. You find out it's probably a lot more to do with politics than anything um, because there were there was uh, Clyde Drexler and another business, uh, uh, a local businessman in the area that were wanting to, to buy the team out, but um, I guess they, they couldn't have come to any agreement with Mr. Allen. Um, so the team folded, but we had a really solid fan base. We had a great rivalry going with the Seattle Storm. There was one season, uh, I think it might have been the third season, where it, it came down to a game between the two of us to see who was going to make it into the playoffs. So, it, yeah, it was... I mean, I loved it there. It was a great place to play. The fans were awesome, educated, um, and I'm sure they'd, you know, maybe love to get another team back there sometime in the near future. Uh, well, we hope so. We we are big fans of the idea of the league expanding. But mm-hmm. from there, you go to joining the Seattle Storm. You kind of skip, hopped, and jumped a, a, a little bit over. Uh, you, well, actually, you changed rivalries. I, we'll, I not, we'll not get into that. Um, but in 2003, 2004, you're on the Storm winning a ring in 2004, and I got to know what that was like because that was one of the most well-known historic teams in WNBA history, the likes of Lauren Jackson, Sue Bird, Betty Lennox. Like, this was a a very well-known, famous team. What was that like to be on that team and and with those players? I mean, I assume you kind of had a relationship with Lauren uh, from from being overseas, but talk to us. Uh, Well, I mean, just even listening to you, talk about it just then just sends you know chills down my spine um you know I can close my eyes and go back to it like it was yesterday that's that's how it has just stayed with me um it was it was phenomenal I mean the euphoria obviously with winning the championship but I mean it wasn't easy because we had 
uh, such a the the group we had was really interesting because we had Betty Lennox in there. You had a lot of personalities, but the one great thing about that group, and I will say that 2004 will go down as my all time favorite year in my career because we had so much fun as a group. Um, not just on the court playing, but off the court. It was um, one where you didn't have to force any team activities. Uh, you put a text out, we're barbecuing on the top of the rooftop. Everybody was there. Like, it it just worked. And even if there were some issues, there was always somebody to, like, take care of it. Um, so that was unique with that group. And we all understood our roles in the team. Um, so I'd come from being a starter with the Portland Fire to now being Sue's backup. And you know, I sometimes get asked about that, um, you know, how was it? And on one hand, it was really easy because, I mean, let's face it, Sue play, played 30-plus minutes a game. So, you know, I was going on in spurts to give her a rest. Um, but on the other hand, it was, you know, I had a lot of pride. And so it was... Um, it was quite hard because I didn't want the level of play to drop when Sue went off the floor. So I put a lot of pressure on myself to be like, hey, when it's my turn out there, I'm going to maintain it. Sue's established it, put us in a great spot. Um, I'm not going to let that, you know, be taken away. So, you know, I felt also there was a lot of pressure with that. Um, And I can't tell you how I felt, how my stomach dropped when she went down and that, semi-final against um, the Minnesota Lynx with the broken nose um, and uh, you know I had to play out the rest of the game and I don't know whether my legs had played more than 15 minutes a game in you know over 2003-2004 so the lactic acid build-up was phenomenal um, so it, you know it was as you said the names that you mentioned they are very very fortunate um, and you know, I don't think it would have happened had we not had the chemistry off the floor as, as well as on. It just it just seemed to click with that group. What was it like in practices going toe to toe? Like the battles between you and Sue Bird, like just getting after each other in practice and that competition. Oh, it was so much fun. I mean, you know, it was like, well, I'm not going to make your life easy. Um, you know, you've definitely got the reputation you're an amazing player but I mean my goal is to go out at practice and I want to beat you at practice um which to me in my head is like well that's just making you better and it's definitely making me better as a player she's like the smartest um person that I know in terms of just her knowledge of the game and reading the plays so I was like a sponge, you know, even at the age I was um and you know being older than her as well I was still a sponge for information from her And, you know, I think that definitely helped me, you know, in my teams um, that I played with afterwards, but it was good. I mean, there was, it was, we were, I mean, physical contact, you know, we didn't hold back when we went uh, toe to toe with each other at practice. Well, that's an interesting aspect because Sue was so young in her career at that point. And now, you know, how the roles have kind of reversed with Jordan Canada and Sue being in the later days of her career. I know that you do follow the league still. Have you watched Jordan Canada and kind of like had some spurts of, oh, this is what it was like? Or like, have you watched her game? What do you think about Jordan Canada if you if you have focused in on that? Because I think that's a really interesting aspect as far as, you know, the person who is right behind her on the roster. Oh, Jordan Canada is a spark. Um, I mean, you talk about someone coming off the bench and bringing that instant energy. Again, like I talked about, not letting the – the tempo of the game drop, she, you know, sometimes increased it. And, you know, I think we really saw how great a player she was when Sue was out with injury and, you know, Canada was, um, you know, playing that point, the bulk of the point guard duty. And, um, no, I had a lot of respect watching her play. Um, she did an amazing job carrying the team there. And, um, it's it's funny because, you know, when I played, I wasn't as such an offensive player as, as she is, and I think that's where the game has changed a lot now. Um, you do have to be a lot more offensive-minded now than what I was able to get away with um, back in my time. So, yeah, I mean, some of the plays that she was making, um, it was just fun to watch. So, you know, and she's going to be the future of the team as well. So, you know, it's... Seattle looking pretty good for down the track post two days. I'm a big Jordan Canada fan. She's, she was, she's been fun to watch. Mm -hmm. Um, Okay. 
back on track in terms of just the timeline of your career in 2005, you signed with the fever. That was a really, in my opinion, great time with the fever. I mean, we're talking about number two seed in the playoffs and a couple of years later, you helped lead them to one of the greatest comebacks in WNBA history. And that, um, I think it was game three, of the Eastern conference semifinals mm-hmm. against Connecticut. Yeah. Um, and yeah. you spent a pretty good amount of time in Indiana and then you, you finished your career in San Antonio. Um, so I think we would be remiss to not talk about the fever in that point of your career um, and just the franchise in general. I mean, obviously, they've had a couple of moments where they've been highly successful and then they've had to rebuild. But what was your time with the fever like? Um, another amazing organization again like you know top to bottom um they really put a great package together uh i mean i can't not talk about tamika catchings when you talk about the indiana fever um so when i made that decision to leave seattle um it was i cried (laughs) because it was an extremely tough decision to make because you know i just come off winning the championship with seattle you know you're always thinking about going back to back and uh, yada yada um but it just, you know, when Seattle contacted, I mean, sorry, when Indiana contacted me during that off season period. And um, I mean, just some of the things that I got offered, it was too hard to knock back. Um, and, you know, in the league, you know, not everybody gets to have guaranteed contracts and I'd never had a guaranteed contract in my career. And so it was kind of like, a major deal for me to all of a sudden be given this contract where I knew that for the next few years, you know, I'm set, you know, um, it doesn't mean I can, I can relax or anything, but I can finally go into a training camp and not have that feel in my stomach. Whereas if you have a bad day, it's like, well, am I going to be on the chopping board next? Um, um, so, you know, there were a few other decisions that went into that, um, final decision as well but I cried and everything but got it and I feel like now it was probably one of the best decisions that I had made um being a defensive player I go to play with the best defensive player in the league um in Tamika Catchings and so it was like a a sucker one two punch you know with her and I and um it was just so much fun out there on the court and you know in that kind of um period we relied on our defense back then to win a lot of our ball games because we weren't shooting the ball very well. It was a good day. I think if we managed 38%. Um, so we relied heavily on our defense, which fit perfectly in my game. And, you know, they found it, found a nice little spot for me in the offense. It was like pass and cut to the corner. And there I stayed for the rest of the offense um, to take place. You know, I knew they know my strengths and weaknesses pretty well. Well, that's a, that's a very curious aspect because, Right now, there's, you know, Seattle's coming off a championship. There's some few, they've got some players who are free agents who are probably going through a similar mindset that you went through. But you said something really interesting there about your, the mental aspect of having that guarantee contract, which is, you know, we could talk forever about that aspect when it comes to the salary cap and the rosters and everything. But I'm curious for you, um, and you touched on this a little bit, but if you could expand on now that you're able to look back, you know, how did you see your game change that you were able to kind of relax your shoulders a little bit and know that you had guaranteed or, you know, because sometimes players say I need that that fire under my butt to push me. So I'm curious for you being able to look back many years later. How do you reflect on that in your game? Well, I think I mean, for me, it didn't change the way I went out and practiced every day in training camp like um that never, my work ethic never changed because of the guaranteed contract. Um, and, you know, I'm not going to talk for other players and that um, and how it, you know, does it relax them or, but um, it also made me want to uh, do better be, and basically as a thank you um, for that opportunity to, you know, have such a, be given the contract so I kind of wanted to give back to them for rewarding me with that contract so in my mindset it was like well I'm going to go harder now because I want to prove to you that you made the right decision um first in bringing me here and rewarding me with those guaranteed contracts so but it just felt it just felt so much better you know on a day-to-day basis where you know some days you don't have a good training practice and I can you know relate to players and I could go and talk to players 
um, that were in my position coming through and and kind of kind of nurture them through you know tough moments and um, so it just helped me relate to most players coming through the league. You have played everywhere. And obviously you have a really great perspective on the international game. I'm fortunate to be able to watch a lot of international basketball. We're seeing um, a big shift of a lot of international collegiate players coming over throughout the years. Um, like in my perspective, you know, obviously Australia has become a powerhouse. Um, you have the United mm-hmm. States, which is a powerhouse. You have Spain, which is a powerhouse. But let's dive into Australia, you know, and just your analysis. You've played with a ton of different clubs. You've represented the national team. Can you talk to us about the growth of Australia basketball and just what that's been like through your time? Well, the the growth has been amazing because when I first started, I was um, basically just part-time or semi-professional, I guess you would call it, um, the majority of players in the league around me. Uh, we all had to work either full-time or part-time um, to be able to survive. Um because it was very, very minimal salaries. Um, and that's one aspect that has definitely changed over the years and obviously here in the WNBA as well. Um, so in terms of players, um, I mean, we Australia has been so successful because collectively as a, we have to be so as one collectively, collectively as a group to succeed. Um, there is so much talent here in America and we can't compete one for one with in terms of like athletic ability not saying we don't have that but um you know there's so much here um and so much talent so we all we're like a puzzle I guess we all make a piece of the puzzle fit together and we make it work um we will along the way you know we've had our superstars um first of you know Michelle Timms kind of was the the player that led the way initially and then Lauren Jackson came on the scene and so we've always been able to have like a superstar to then um, put personnel around them um, to make it work and we are very fundamentally sound players Um, they the fundamentals are hammered into you at a very young age you know your ball handling skills uh, just defense just the concepts of um, of things Um, so we're very sound in that regard and um, I think you know, that is why we have, and we're very tough. We never give up. We're very tough. We're like, uh, you get in our face, we'll get in your face. Um, um, but obviously all within the rules of the game. Um, <laughs> but, you know, we're never, you know, we just don't give up. Um, and I think that has really enabled us to maintain our top. We were number two there for a while. We have, I think, maybe dropped um, in the last few years um, a couple of places. But, you know, we're still up there in that top five range. And now, you know, you're looking at this Cambridge being that player now that the, the team is being revolved around as that superstar player. Um, and, you know, the, the Australians have uh, probably filled the WNBA with the most number of foreign players um, in the league. And so you can see that, you know, coaches are looking to Australians to bring over here because we are also very coachable um, and we'll just basically, you tell us what to do, we'll do it. We work hard. Um, and we have a good reputation. Well, you've touched on this, and it was a perfect segue into my next question. I want you to help us compare and contrast the W and the Australian League. You know, what are the big differences? Why have we seen so many players excel and, and then excel at the W? Like, the first thing when I think of an Australian player, and maybe I'm wrong about this, when I think of the Australian League, I keep hearing physicality. Mm-hmm. When I think of Australian players, though, I always think they shoot lights out. I mean, I, I Liz is a, a shooter, you know, Lauren Jackson can shoot and like I, Sammy Wickham, like every player who comes over, I feel like has that shooting ability just like in their veins. Talk, compare and contrast, educate us, please. No, I mean, that's right. We, um, I think, you know, there's Beck Allen, I think with New York, like good three point mm-hmm. shooter. Um, the, yeah, we, I mean, I think, we are we have differences, but we are very similar as well, and I think that's why we find it very. Um, I mean, I don't mean easy as in it's so easy to come over here to American play, but it's easy tra- to transition from going from Australia into the WNBA um, because we feel it's fairly close to our style of play, and um, 
uh, the teams are always looking for role players. And like you said, we have great shooters. So, you know, Sammy Wickham, I mean, how awesome. I mean, we're claiming her now, just so you know. <laughs> <laughs> we claim her. She is an Australian citizen now. So, um, but, you know, you talk about her game, a, a pure shooter. And so, you know, when Seattle needs some baskets, I mean, you talk about instant offense. But um, let me take it back to the great Sandy Brondello. Phoenix Merc- mm-hmm. Mercury coach, who is also the coach of the Australian Opals, you know, to me, Sandy was one of the most purest. Um, and her game was basically revolved around her jump shot. Um, not so much a three point shot, but her jump shot, you know, just coming down off the in transition, um, that mid range jump shot. Um, so, you know, it's all started with her, but we all kind of have a strength that we just you know, use the, and I always tell the young players coming through, it's like, what's your strength and really embolden that strength and make that stand out. And I feel like shooting is a very big strength now coming through the ranks and uh, into the WNBA for me, Australian players. Oh yeah. Especially with, you know, the, the wave of change that we've seen in regards to style of play, maybe that has to do a little bit with the shot clock change with the reset yeah. to 14 seconds and all, but yeah, the game is a lot quicker now, isn't it? <laughs> oh yeah. Oh man. And and like, honestly, watching some of these Australians play, it seems like they're already ahead of that. Um, talk to me a little bit about how you've seen the WNBA grow over the years. And I'm actually curious hearing you talk about the comparison of the W and the Australian league is, do you feel that the modern league um, and maybe this is a, a little bit too hard of a question or, or mm-hmm. too long winded, but do you feel that like the growth of the W has made it easier for Australian players to come over because of that element of shooting? Oh, for sure. There's, there's um, it's created definitely a lot more opportunity um, for Australian players to, to come out and get a chance. And the growth of the WNBA, um, cause like I said, I've been since 98 um, playing, so I had 14 seasons in it and, you know, every year just something new was added, a new element was added to to the league and, you know, now the possibilities, you know, just seem to be endless now um, for the league. You know, you've got more players and the union now being able to contribute to like what, you know, with the, the unions and that, you know, asking for things that, you know, wish we had a few more, few years ago. Um, but you know, there's, um, that, let me just, I'm just trying to find the words to, to phrase it here for you, but you know, there's more possibilities for individuals off the floor, um, because of the success of the WNBA, you know, sponsorships, individual sponsorships, um, because of the media visibility, um, it's just creating so many more openings for players, um, not just here, but around the world, because I mean, you ask some Australians, they're all watching the WNBA over in Australia as well. Um, and then especially just this year with the bubble, the wobble, as you mentioned in one of your <laughs> lives, bubble, wobble, whatever you want to call it. Um, it, because so many more games were being played, everybody got invested in the league. You know, they were watching, they were able to cheer for certain players. Um, and that's the thing about the WNBA is like, you know, you've got to give it more visibility um, and you see the numbers showing that people are watching and, you know, it's just amazing to see. And that's been the huge change, I think, from when I was playing to now. Um, and, you know, just also just touching on just the platform that it gives the players, which we've seen how they've used that in such a positive way this year um, mm-hmm. to try and instrument change off the court um, because we're all human as well. And so um, the platform that it has given them has just been phenomenal. And I applaud, I'm so proud of, um, of where the league is right now. Not to real quick, Rachel, I do want to give a shout out to all the Australian fans as outside of America, our number one country for listeners for this podcast is Australia. So shout out to them. Oi, 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 Aussie, Aussie, Aussie. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. You, you mentioned um, that you don't feel like or something on the lines of, of the type of player that you were uh, with that tenacity or maybe defensive mentality or, you know, whatever it was you feel like were your strengths back in the day. You didn't feel like... Um, you could get away with necessarily now, which I find interesting because I, I think in my mind, 
players like you are one in a million, you know, coaches are constantly looking for that tenacity and that grit because uh, anyway, I'll get off that. But I do want to ask, you you know, if you had to com- compare maybe your game to maybe a current player in the league, is there anyone that you see um, that maybe reminds you of yourself a little bit? Oh, geez. Um, Diana. Oh, no, no, no. Diana doesn't. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> that was pretty good about that. Um, Oh, but it was fun to go up against Diana. Let me tell you about that. Um, Hold on. Do you have any good stories? Uh, you know, the funny thing with Diana is a super nice person, super nice person um, off the court. But when, you know, the competitor in her, when she steps on that court, it's like, wow, do you know who, like, do we know each other? <laughs> you know? Um, I, I love that line of super nice person off the court. I, oh, I, sure. That is like my favorite. Um, that makes me like, I love that player. I don't know who it is. I love that player right there. No, she is awesome. And like, you know, the, I would actually get the, the job set, you know, quite a few of the times to defend her. Um, and, you know, we didn't, she didn't hold back. I didn't hold back. Um, what had to watch the elbows every now and then. Um, but that's that's the beauty of the game. You know, it's like we can all know each other and be friends with each other off the court, but the competitiveness, once you step on, it's like, I don't know you, um, and we just go at it. So, and I, yeah. And I mean, which is also with, you know, that unique situation with them all being together in the wobble, um, the the play that we saw was some of the best basketball, to be honest. Um, and yet then they go off and they see each other in the, foyer of their hotels or whatever and you know i'll go and have a a drink together or something Um, crazy yeah now i've forgotten what we were talking about before that um (laughs) there's so many tangents we can kind of go off right (laughs) well a play a play players 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 who do i um i don't know because i really do feel that most point guards in this league now have very much a more um, offensive mind. Um, yeah. I mean, there are players I could say, yeah, they have that similarity in defense, but they, I, to be honest, I, I really feel like they just all have more of an offensive mind than what I did. Um, and I think you touched on it earlier when we talked about the shot clock and how that made the game speed up. And, you know, one of the aspects of the game today that I feel is so important and is utilized so much more maybe than when I played um, and I wasn't very good at it, is the pick and roll. Mm -hmm. Like as a guard now, you have to be very good at, um, you know, using the pick and roll um, and being able to read the, you know, the defense so quickly um, and be able to make plays off that uh, to not just create for yourself, but obviously then to open up for others. And I feel like, you know, as the ball handler these days, um, you've got to be on top of the pick and roll game. What advice would you give to, um, and I'm going to switch it up. I love asking this question because it Mm -hmm. just gives insight to that next generation, you know, um, whether that would be people striving to be a coach, striving to be um, a player, a collegiate player in the WNBA. Um, I want to ask it for my young international players all over the world. What advice would you give a young player um, who had aspirations of making it to the next level, whether it would be the college game or even the WNBA? Well, first of all, I would say like be yourself. Like don't go the, don't go out there and try. You know, you're at a tryout or something like that, and don't try and be someone that you're not. Um, go out there and be yourself. I touched on it before, knowing your strengths and weaknesses, and making those strengths shine. Um, it doesn't mean you don't work on those weaknesses. Um, obviously, you need to, but you need to just show what your strengths are and let it shine. Um, and don't be afraid to do that. Um, it's all for me it's like quality uh quality over quantity as well in terms of when you go out and practice whether it's by yourself um or sometimes with a team it's like you know every single thing you do you've got to do it at the highest level that you can like you don't go out there and practice something at 50% because that's not going to transfer into the game you have to go out there and practice like it is a game um and that makes it a lot easier than to transfer it into the game. And that'll have you ready, prepared. Um, so, you know, when you're called, you're ready to go. But I see too many players, you know, sometimes 
you know, kind of coasting a little bit of practice in that and you go watch film and film doesn't lie and you see you do those um, exec, you have those traits in the game. And so what I would tell young players is like every single thing that you do, you do it at 100% because if you're not, then that means you're not getting better um, and somebody else is. So it's like, you know, how hungry are you? And set yourself some goals. You've got to have some goals. You've got to have something to to have your eyesight set for. Um, and you know, you've some you know you've got to make them realistic, and then you've got to end with something that you know. Ultimately, what's your dream goal that you want to achieve? And you know, you're not going to know if you're going to achieve if you can achieve those things if you don't give it a hundred percent. And I'm all about you know not having any regrets. Um, this may not have worked out for me but I was always going to give it my best chance to see if it could. Um, And I know that, you know, only a small percentage of players um, in the world get this opportunity. So yeah, there is a, you know, a strong chance that you may not make it, but how will you know if you don't give it a go? So, you know, set your goals, have your dreams, give it your best shot, quality every single time and be yourself and know your strengths and weaknesses. I love that. I'm I'm air clapping, so I don't want to just ruin my mic right now by clapping <laughs> into the mic. But I, I love that. It's it's super inspirational. Um, final question for you before we we finally let you go. We've taken too much of your time, but what are you up to these days? And a follow up of I heard you like karaoke. What is your go to <laughs> karaoke song? We told you that. <laughs> I I have sources. I can't reveal my sources. Uh, yeah. but I, I need to know what your go to karaoke song is after you tell us what you're doing these days. All right. Well, right now I'm trying to, so I've been doing um, commentary for the Indiana Fever and uh, I was able to commentate quite a number of games um, locally um, the past season, hoping to continue, you know, with, with the Fever um, for the next season. Um, But I also want to try and expand and venture into the college commentary as well. I would like to kind of be involved a year, you know, in a year round, calendar um can i just stop it's... you you should yep. so whoever's listening to this we got to get her on something whether it's big <laughs> or whatever it might be because listening to you is phenomenal oh uh, well i i appreciate that i i hope i i hope i'm making some sense um sometimes i question myself i uh, <laughs> um but no i i i just love the game and i just love you know talking about what i'm seeing um yeah, you know, there's all the stats and stuff, but when I'm watching a game and commentating a game, you know, I want to tell you about what I'm seeing out there, maybe what some players aren't doing. Like just I want to make it my own unique perspective. Um, I'm not trying to be um, – there's a lot of great commentators out there and I just want to bring my style. Um, and so hopefully trying to, you know, broaden that into the college game. Um, been really enjoying um, watching uh, watching the college game a little bit more closely over the last couple of years. Um, um, hopefully, cross fingers that may happen. Um, but you know, that's it's yeah, it's always going to be in my in my veins. So I'll always be somewhere involved with basketball somehow. Oh, and now yeah. my karaoke song. Yeah, there we well, go. You try. You yeah, almost yeah. tried to get away with it. You know, well, so you know, we belong by Pat Benatar. Um, that's kind of a nice one there. Um, oh, that's a good one. After watching the Pitch Perfect with Amy and you know, for Amy in the show, um, belting it out, the Australian actress. Um, I mean, and that was her name in the show. I just want that noted. I would never say that. Um, <laughs> so that's my latest karaoke song. It used to be um, Tina Turner, um, Rolling, Rolling. <laughs> okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, that's a good one. Um, but someone didn't text you, Rachel, did they, and tell you about that? We have to keep our sources quiet, okay? <laughs> <laughs> but no, I, you know what? I'm all about having fun, and I am the worst singer, I will tell you. I, I am tone deaf, <laughs> but I will still get up there and have fun. It actually says it on your Wikipedia page. That I'm tone deaf or that I like <laughs> Carrie? <laughs> <laughs> That you like karaoke. You can add that part on that, and while you're at it, change my height. Okay. It's it's funny because uh, while we were talking, I looked down at like the finer details, and it says you're listed five seven in the W, 
but in the WNLB MBL, you're listed as five four. So I find it hilarious that they say that, but then they go with your your larger height when it goes to your breakdown. The 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 funniest was when I was in Portland. Um, they would actually call me out in centimeters, which I think messed everybody up. And so it was like at 165 <laughs> centimeters. <laughs> That's People amazing. Like, what? <laughs> Was, was there, I just need to ask this one question. Like, was there a point where somebody said, like, we're going to write you down as 5'7"? <laughs> no, no one even, like, questioned it, which is so weird. Um, I was like, okay, 5'7". I'm sure probably, you know, talk behind my back about it, but no one <laughs> questioned it or corrected it, um, even though every year we get all that, that done, height, weight. Um, but anyway, I'm rolling with it. <laughs> rolling, rolling. Well, rolling. it would also happen, you know, in Australia as well. We'd get imports in, and we would expect, you know, a six foot one player, and they'd come in at five nine. So it kind of like worked up both ways. Oh wow, that's that's a cool, interesting aspect. Well, we're so thankful for your time and for joining us and educating us on a plethora of topics. We hope to have you back on the pod at some point during the season, so we can break down some game tape with you. Um, I would but thank love you so to. Much. Yes, that would that be would, awesome. That would, that would, it would be an honor for us. Um, yeah. Well, thank you so much. And I hope you have a great day and are, are able to uh, accomplish all your needs. Thank you very much. I appreciate you guys having me on. Have a great one. Cheers.